Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. You can get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash inodino. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. We have a bunch of news, and Sabrina's back. So Hooray. I won't be doing it all by myself. <laughs> all by yourself. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> our dinosaur of the day is Shantungasaurus. And we have part three of our epic dinosaur road trip when we went to the Two Medicine Dinosaur Center in Bynum, Montana. And after going on a day-long dig, we got a chance to speak to Dave Trexler, Corey Coverdell, and Kara Ludwig. But more importantly, I found a piece of a dinosaur eggshell. After being asked if you were colorblind because you were That was for the fossils, eggs. not the eggshells. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> can all be fossil hunters. Yeah, not like me. But first, we want to give a big shout out and thanks to all of our current Patreon supporters. We got a new one today, so that was very exciting. And your support really helps to keep us going and motivates us and encourages us. And we really appreciate it. So if you'd like to hop onto that bandwagon, then please check out our page at patreon.com slash I know dino. Jumping into the news, there's a new article published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B that might tell us a little bit more about what color dinosaurs were. It was written by Hanlu Twyman and others, and the basis of this comes from the assumption that if an animal can see a certain color, then it's more likely to use that color for display. And we've talked a little bit about how birds are tetrachromats, so they have an extra cone cell in their eye that can detect UV light. And in fact, we know that a lot of birds have UV patterns on their feathers, so they can see it and then therefore they use it for display. It makes sense. Other recent research has shown that a gene called CYP2J19... Very catchy. Yeah, scientists are good at that. ...is linked to the ability to see more shades of red. Specifically, the gene allows the animal to convert yellow pigment after it's eaten from other animals or plants or whatever into a red pigment or oil. And we've talked before about how most animals use different cone cells on their retina to detect color. So birds have four different types and humans have three different types, usually described as red, green, and blue, but that really isn't the whole story. The sensitivity of the cones all overlap. In fact, the green and the red ones have very similar sensitivities and they overlap throughout most of their sensitivity. The magic of adding a red retinal oil droplet is that on a red cone, it acts as a cutoff filter. So there's a, literally a drop of oil on the red cone that is red colored. So the only thing, it absorbs all the colors other than red. So that lets it just see red and not these things that it overlaps with like green. Hmm. So... Since it's not picking up signals from other colors on the electromagnetic spectrum, it therefore gets a better signal for the red colors. And this results in an ability to differentiate more shades of red than humans are capable of or other animals that don't have these red oil droplets creating a cutoff filter. So as an example, zebra finches have this red droplet on their cone because they're birds. And they also have bright red beaks which appear to be used for sexual selection. So a potential mate had the incentive to be able to see how healthy and therefore red its beak is. So if it can discern between one that's like, oh, it's not that red, maybe it's a, a little, little bit more unhealthy. Pinkish. Yeah, <laughs> then it wouldn't be as desirable. So if you can discern all these little differences, you're more likely to get a good mate that's healthy and has that nice, perfectly red beak. So being able to detect small differences in red is very useful for them. So modern turtles and birds, but not crocodiles or snakes, we see this gene and the corresponding red oil droplet in their cone. That's and, interesting. Turtles, too. Yeah. 
So since birds and turtles are believed to have a common ancestor, we can kind of use that to estimate when this oil drop evolved because it wasn't too long before that that snakes split off. So since birds and turtles are believed to have a common ancestor that predates when archosaurs split up into dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and crocodilians, it's believed that they all inherited this gene, but in the case of crocodiles, they lost it later, since in modern crocodilians we don't see this gene or the red oil droplet, although some modern animals do have yellow and green oil droplets, but not the red one, which is pretty interesting. And there's some speculation about, well, maybe if they stop exhibiting red colors, but they still have yellow and green colors, they might conserve that gene. It's hard to say. But all of this means that dinosaurs would have been able to discern minor differences in shades of red, and they would be able to produce a red pigment, so it follows that some of them might have been red as well, taking advantage of that increased red perception. Might as well color yourself red too. I wonder what they think of your red hair. It's not red enough. It's a different gene. <laughs> that comes from the melanosome. Oh, uh, yeah. But they could probably see a finer detail than we can. Might be too orange for their taste. Could be. <laughs> we have another paleopathology, and it's not surprisingly from another hadrosaur. This time it's septic arthritis, which is another first for dinosaurs. The findings were published in the Royal Society Open Science, and the article was written by Jennifer Anne and others. So an ulna and radius were uncovered from an unknown hadrosaur from the Navasink Formation in New Jersey, and from the formation it's believed to be about 70 million years old. They found the bones a while ago, but bones from the area are often very fragile, so they wanted to do a detailed CT scan rather than trying to slice into it or doing other analysis. It took them over 10 years to get it scanned on a sufficiently powerful machine, and they went to the Center for Nanoscale Systems at Harvard to do their scan, and they embedded the bones in styrofoam to make sure that nothing would break when scanning them or transporting them. They couldn't scan the whole bone in the scanner, but they were only interested in the cauliflower-like growth at the elbow of the two bones. Which doesn't sound good no, for the dinosaur. It's really not good. But luckily they could fit a big enough chunk of the bone in that they could see that whole end on both the ulna and the radius. So the scans make the growth very obvious, and the end of the bone almost looks like it has a big chunk of mud still stuck to it. Or something like that. Is that part of the bone? or? Yeah. Oh. So it, it definitely isn't a typical smooth, nice bone. And cauliflower-like is a very good description of the growth. And then on top of that growth, there are other areas of the bone that are just about completely gone. Oh, no. Yeah. So that's because septic arthritis is an infection in the bone around joints, which destroys the cartilage erodes the joint, and eventually causes the bones to fuse together. That's awful. Yeah, it has been seen in modern crocodilians and sea turtles as well as humans. And the way the author put it, quote, it probably had a bent arm with either little or no movement at the elbow, kind of like Igor from Frankenstein, oh. end quote. <laughs> Poor <laughs> dinosaur. Yeah, and she also believes that it would have had a limp because of that. I wonder if it lived longer because it looked unappetizing. Probably not. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> if it slowed it down, I think that would maybe make it live less long. Put it out of its misery. Yeah. But Anna also said, quote, reptiles and birds both deal with horrific injuries, so although I'm sure it hurt, it probably trudged through. Well, it had to. Yeah, exactly. And I, I have seen some birds with some pretty gnarly looking joints. That's true. Pigeons, sometimes they have one foot and that foot <laughs> looks really gross. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Interestingly, septic arthritis usually just sticks to one joint in reptiles, but in mammals it tends to spread throughout the body. Unfortunately, they only found the radius and ulna, the two forearm bones. 
so we can't tell how much it spread, but they are pretty sure that it would have at least affected the humerus, the upper arm bone, on the other side of the elbow. But whether or not it spread throughout the rest of the body, we don't know. I hope it didn't. <laughs> yeah. That sounds awful. Yep. And there's nothing that dinosaur could have done about it. And it would have had to just keep on going on if it wanted to survive. And just bad times. Yep. Let's go to some happier news. <laughs> <laughs> so next, thanks to Chris who shared this one with us via Twitter. In Bolivia, a tour guide named Grover Marquina found the largest carnivorous dinosaur footprint ever found so far. I say so far. The footprint is about four feet or 1.2 meters or 115 centimeters wide. And it was probably of an abelosaurus, which we talked about in depth in episode 79. Before that, the largest carnivorous footprint found was 110 centimeters, about five centimeters smaller. And that was in New Mexico. Next, after less than a month, the Spinosaurus from the Reading Public Museum in Pennsylvania that was vandalized is intact and back in front of the museum. We talked about it when it first happened, but to recap, three men ripped off the Spinosaurus claws, broke part of its spine, and took out some of its teeth. Really did some damage there. The community raised $10,000 to get the dinosaur repaired, and the animatronic dinosaur lives again. There's a crew from China who came to repair it and gave it new foam body parts, and now it has an alarm system with motion detectors and alerts to help protect it in the future. That's good. That is. Next, thanks to Chris who shared this one with us via Facebook. Apparently the tongue twister She Sells Seashells by the Seashore has a history. And Garrett was bragging earlier that he already knew this history, <laughs> but... It's... I don't think it's particularly well substantiated, but... The rumor has it, at least. I'm going to choose to believe it. Okay. <laughs> so, supposedly, and I believe, it's about Mary Anning, a fossil hunter in England born in 1799 in Dorset. Her dad taught her and her brother, Joseph, how to collect fossilized shells on the Jurassic Coast, and they sold the shells as souvenirs as their family income, so they needed to do it to survive. And when Mary was 12, she and her brother found an ichthyosaur skull, and then a few months later, they found the rest of the skeleton. And this drew a lot of attention, and by the 1820s, Mary was in charge of the family fossil business, and she was working with scientists to help classify her finds, which is amazing. In 1823, at age 24, she found a plesiosaur, and she also found some dinosaur species. But unfortunately for Mary, her family was poor and Mary was a woman in the 1800s. So a lot of people didn't take her findings seriously until Georges Cuvier said that they were genuine. Still, there were a lot of scientists, unfortunately, also took credit for her work. But in 1908, Terry Sullivan wrote The Tongue Twister about Mary. She sells seashells by the seashore, though obviously not everyone knows the story behind it anymore. Yeah, Mary Anning is a pretty iconic paleontologist from the early days of dinosaurs and archosaurs, so everybody should know a little bit about her at least. Yeah. Yeah, she's more well-known now than, say, 100 years ago. Yep. And last, according to Pocket Gamer, there's a new app called Jurassic Go Dinosaur Snap Adventure, which is <laughs> in some way similar to Pokemon Go, but not completely. It sounds like they combined Pokemon Go and Pokemon Snap into a double knockoff. Well, I don't know, because this game was developed, or the idea for this game was developed about a year ago. Okay. The gameplay is very similar to Pokemon Snap, too. Is it? I, yeah. You would know better than me. Pokemon Snap. I think it was for Nintendo 64, at least that was the version I had. It was basically like you were on a track, and you had a camera, and you took pictures of Pokemon as you like were carted through some environment with Pokemon in it, and then the better the picture, the more points you got kind of thing. Uh, so that's kind of similar. Yeah. So in this game, which was developed by Bebop B, creator of a similar game called Snapimals, you take photos of cute dinosaurs, and it's a photography game. You can only take five photos in each stage, and then you select the three best photos to submit. And then each photo is graded on a scale of 1 to 10, and it's based on the shot's framing and how rare the scenario is. Which, I don't know the details. I'm guessing the type of dinosaur or the kind of pose they do. 
The idea is that you're displaying your photos at a museum and you have to photograph a set number of dinosaur species in scenarios. And some dinosaurs are harder to photograph than others, but you can use props like harmonicas or bouncy balls to make the dinosaurs move <laughs> around. Yeah, that sounds kind of cool. I think that kind of game would be really fun in VR if you could like go through a dinosaur environment and take pictures of them. Yeah, that's That'd be true. Cool. Maybe that's their next step. Yep, maybe. There's a lot of great dinosaur things you can do in VR. There are. I was just at the SIGGRAPH conference in Anaheim last week, and they had, it, it's not exactly dinosaur related, but there was a ton of VR stuff. And there was this one, it's a VR version of an archaeological dig. And it was, you could see an actual dig site, but then through VR, you're not really messing up things and <laughs> you still learn about what's in there and what's important. Yeah, that's really cool. Now we're going to go to our interview with the Two Medicine Dinosaur Center. And we had a chance to talk to Dave Trexler, the head paleontologist and one of the museum's founders, Corey Coverdale, the current director, and Kara Ludwig, a field instructor who took us on our dig. Yeah, and taught us how to find fossils. Yep. So I guess the biggest question, the easiest question, maybe, well, maybe not the easiest answer, is what drew you to Bynum to open a dinosaur museum here? Well, my mother found her first dinosaur bone just about five miles west of here back in 1917. My family homesteaded here, and I knew there were dinosaur remains here before I knew there were dinosaur museums. So <laughs> it's always been here that was my my first place to look. But then uh, I have worked pretty much in all the important places in Western North America. And what that has done is you have to leave home and look at other places before you realize how special home is. And for me, the, the wonderful thing was the two medicine formation turned out to be unique in the world. We, we found so many firsts, if you will, so many new things here that uh, it really was a spectacular place to be for paleo. Great. And speaking of firsts, you guys found locally the first nesting dinosaur, I guess you would say? We found the first baby dinosaur bones in a nest anywhere in the world, yes. That discovery changed the way the entire world thought of animals, and in general, reptiles at least, not just dinosaurs, because of the, the unique way they were preserved. So, really cool find. Yeah, definitely. And another unique thing about your museum is you have the world's largest dinosaur replica, I guess? You'd call it? Yeah, reconstruction. So it's 137 feet long, 137 and a half, and it's a model of Seismosaurus, which was found down in New Mexico. Some people no longer use the name Seismosaurus. There's been a paper to publish changing the name, but there's some problems with those publications, and <laughs> someday somebody's going to go through that whole thing, and it'll either be back to Seismosaurus or the Diplodocus Hawley. Mm -hmm. How did you decide to make that replica? The replica was built actually because we were contracted to build the centerpiece for the largest dinosaur traveling exhibition in the world, the, the thing called DinoFest, mm -hmm. back in the 1990s. And the largest exhibition wanted the largest dinosaur to be a part of it. The problem was at that time, a couple of paleontologists were having this big argument over whose was biggest. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Dave Gillette with his Seismosaurus versus Jim Jensen and Supersaurus. And we had to determine which one actually would have been the biggest. And then part of what we were asked to do was determine whether there could have been something even bigger out there. And of course, there always could have been. But... What we ended up doing at that point was going to every museum in Western North America that housed sauropod remains and contacting basically all the other museums around the world and getting measurements on certain bones that would give us an idea of 
what sizes that they had and just bone pieces. We have many, many more bone pieces in collections than we do skeletons. Mm. So pieces tell us more actually. And the result of all of that was we were able to build this replica to not only match what we determined to be slightly the largest of the two size and source versus super source, but then scale it up slightly to match the largest individual bones we also were made aware of. So that's cool. how it came to be. And then when the exhibit ended, you just got it back and wrapped it up in your museum? When the exhibit ended, the company contacted us and asked us if we would like to buy it. Hmm. And uh, isolated museum out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, <laughs> we knew how much they paid to have it built, and there's no way we could ever have afforded that. But years negotiation and a really creative refinance on most everything we owned, and we ended up with it. Cool. Do you think it draws a lot of people to the museum? It probably accounts for maybe one out of seven people <laughs> that come through the door, I would say. It's pretty good. Yeah. Speaking of things that brings people in, there's the Montana Dinosaur Trail, I want to say it's called, with 12 museums or thereabouts? 14. 14? Okay. I know one of them closed, too, recently. It used to be 15. Oh, 15. <laughs> actually, actually, we've had uh, two close, and we've added one since the inception. Cool. Do you think that brings a lot of people here, too? Do you get a lot of people with that? There's like a passport or something you can get stamped at every museum. I suspect that it brings in actually a few more than the actual size and source exhibit. Oh, wow. It's probably on the neighborhood of one out of five people hmm. come through the door are aware of the Montana Dinosaur Trail. Cool. A lot of times they're not necessarily actively doing the passport, but... <laughs> they now know, oh, the Montana Dinosaur Trail. I should go to all those museums. Do you? I was wondering how that worked because I know you like get a shirt or something if you go to all of them. Do you guys have like a stock of these shirts? <laughs> or what do you do when someone gets here? They're like, okay, I'm done. The shirt is sent to the... Oh, gotcha. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a one lady who takes care of all the, the background for the, the organization. And uh, she... Uh, gets the shirt orders from us and uh, sends out the shirt. And then, of course, you've also probably drawn a lot of people with your instructor-led, um, like the digs. Hmm. And We run between three and 400 people every summer through our field programs. Wow. So it's quite a few people. It's actually one of the primary ways we fund our organization. Great. And so. because of the programs, we have actually more attendance other than the big government funded facilities you know really are, are advertised as draws in their own right things like makosha park and the museum of the rockies the fort peck interpretive center we're number four after those three. Oh wow that's, that's great especially for a town of what did you say 31 31 <laughs> 37 in the summer how many of the 31 people that live in bynum work here Work here or associated with this place. <laughs> Eight in the winter and <laughs> fourteen. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. I bet if you did like the statistics, you might be like the largest percentage employer of like a city. <laughs> <laughs> we should run those statistics. That could be fun. <laughs> yeah. You probably employ like more people than like Microsoft employs in like <laughs> Seattle <laughs> and things like that. <laughs> That's cool. But only during the summer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking about like what we did today. What was the official name of it? So it was a full day dig program. So we like to take people out to our sites and show them how to identify dinosaur bone, get them understanding how paleontology actually works. It's not all finding a perfect dinosaur in the ground with just a layer of sand covering it, and there you go, and you just dig it out, dig out each bone, and there you go. <laughs> it's none of that. <laughs> none of that. We are very focused on scientific research and not just in collecting things because they're neat. We really want to get it across to the public that paleontology actually is proper science 
and that it involves a lot of acquiring data and interpreting things based on that. Finding neat stuff is really cool, though. Finding neat stuff <laughs> is really cool. And when did you guys start that program? Actually, the programs started this facility. Oh, really? We were doing research in public education programs through the Old Trail Museum for many years. Hmm. But in 1995, the board down there decided that times were tough and research really didn't contribute that much. And this area was famous for what had already been done. So they really wanted to switch more to straight interpretive programs. And some of us hadn't gone to school for nine years after high school and obtained degrees to tell people what our colleagues were doing and not being able to do it ourselves. So we came up here. Cool. What's the most exciting thing someone has found? I know somebody found a tyrannosaur tooth. A few days on, one of the, on one of the sites. Mm-hmm. On one of the digs as like a, what well, a, a, a layman. A participant, <laughs> yeah, yeah in, yeah. in the nesting site. Yeah, so just last week we had a woman find a tyrannosaur tooth. And the week before that, a child actually found the first embryonic bone uh, at our nest site. That was pretty exciting. And it was kind of just luck. But, you know, <laughs> that's really cool. <laughs> See, from our programs, we've had people find dinosaur feet. There's been part of a, well, you think it's an ornithomimid arm, probably. We don't really know exactly what it is yet. A lot of little bits. A lot of cool stuff, though. The most significant thing participants have found so far out with us is a site that was discovered in 1997, where we have remains. We collected over 2,000 specimens, uh, individual bones and, and parts, from at least uh, 11 individual animals. And it's the first site where multiple individuals of uh, tyrannosaurs and hadrosaurs have been found together without being a what we call an accretional bone bed, without being just something that's carried down a river and, and piled. These animals were actually interacting with each other when they died. It makes it a a world-class discovery, and, and actually papers are in press now. The problem we've got when you find something like that is you've got you know, 20, 30, sometimes even a 50-year lag based on how long it actually takes to preserve and prepare all these bones out of the matrix. Mm. Mm-hmm. That discovery is now still the main thing you see out there people working on, and hopefully we'll have enough of it done this year, that more than just the introductory papers that have already been published will actually get done this year. Well, that'd be great. How many different sites have you had participants be on? Well over 50. Wow. Are they mostly local? I know you do some joint work with another museum in Montana. We've actually collaborated on dig sites all across Montana with six other members of the Montana Dinosaur Trail. Hmm. We do a lot of work all over. It has to do with staffing more than anything. We have you know, degreed paleontologists on staff, which most of the other facilities don't, so they like to share us. <laughs> it's, it is one of the nice things that we can do. There are other facilities, a couple of them have wonderful preparation labs, people who can put these things back together in the lab. So a lot of times it's a synergistic thing. We do some of the work, they do some of the work, and we collaborate on the publications and Mm -hmm. works to everybody's benefit. That's great. It is. I was thinking today as a participant, though, like that's putting a lot of trust in your participants. (laughs) (laughs) It's like me. I I thought it was really good, like how much time you took to explain to us, like, okay, this is how you find fossils beforehand and like things to look for and stuff but like i was very bad at finding fossils and i was a little bit worried like oh no i hope i don't mess anything up when i'm digging (laughs) yeah you didn't (laughs) if you want could share with us like some of the things you were telling us about like okay what do you look for when you're looking for fossils so when we are looking for bone and trying to determine the difference between bone and rock you're looking for a difference basically in color, shape, and texture, 
often the color of bone is very dissimilar from the rock that it's embedded in. Not all the time. (laughs) Not all the time. And then uh, the shape, something that is shaped like a bone, or often because of the structure of bone, things are more angular and less rounded, unless they've been carried away from someplace upstream. And then the texture, again, this is this is probably the biggest thing, is looking for something that's the texture of bone. Looks kind of like a cluster of straws that are bunched together. So you see a linear pattern on one side, and then you would see something that's more porous at the end. That's not always easy either, but those in combination and the lick test... <laughs> Where if you lick your thumb and then touch uh, touch the bone and see if it sticks, you will actually feel that bone stick to like suck up that water. Thanks to capillary action, you can figure out whether it's bone. Hopefully. Again, not all the time. <laughs> yeah. And you also have that, what's that device you just showed us called? It's called a scintillometer. So uh, it detects radiation. We don't get to use it all the time, but every once in a while we'll find a quarry that has some radioactive dinosaur bone, and uh, we can use that to do a little bit of exploration. It's not super useful, but it is a lot of fun. (laughs) I usually just look for uh, something that's not rock. So when you uh, look at sandstone all day uh, through a microscope, you get pretty accustomed to (laughs) recognizing something that's not sandstone. And if you look for certain layers, like we were talking about the difference between something that's going to be a well-drained soil that has a lot of plant material in it versus something that looks gray and dull and like it didn't have as much oxygen content because you don't have as much oxidation of iron stuff in it, you might be more likely to find bone there. Dave actually did a lot of uh, surveying in his airplane. One of the things that we look for are certain textural patterns in rock layers. And the key to that is really terrestrial sediments are a jumble. You look at a series of rock that was laid down originally on land, and it looks different You know, if you travel a few feet either direction or whatever. And that's very distinctive rather than seeing the same rock stratum you know, mm. across for miles on, on an exposure. So that's really the difference between terrestrial and marine sediments. And so that's the first key. You have to look for something terrestrial. And then from an airplane, you can still spot you know, terrestrial sediments. You can also spot certain features that are giveaways for you know, signs that say, look here. One of the things that tell us a lot are accretional beds, uh, channel lag deposits, basically where streams used to flow and at the bottom of the stream bed, there's always the, the rocks that are pushed along on the bottom of the stream. In areas where fossils are preserved, a lot of times those are actually the fossils we're looking for. Hmm. And what that tells us in an area like that is a general picture of what animals and sometimes even what plants were living in that particular region and in that snapshot in time. So if you see a structure that is obviously a a filled-in channel, which is, if you know what you're looking for, not too difficult to spot from an airplane, then you can say, okay, at the bottom of of that structure, there's probably one of those things we should look for. And that plus 20, 30, 40 years of experience. (laughs) (laughs) We won't go into how many years. (laughs) 50, 60. (laughs) Cool. Is that how you found... The site where you found your notosaur? No, the notosaur was near a site we were already working. And uh, there happened to be a road that some people had tried to cut into the to get to the lower <laughs> site. And just one day I was walking up the road. Uh, because we've been working this site for two, three months. And uh, when I got to the top of the hill, I looked down and there's this little thing that looked kind of like a turtle shell. But when you look closer, it turned out to be a piece of armor, one of the the scoots from an armored dinosaur. So we uh, got out and we 
started poking around, looking a little bit closer, and you find another one, find another one. We dug back a little bit. Turns out we found the better part of a hind leg from that animal, and uh, this was just late in the fall, so we basically had to cover everything up and come back to it. So we came back the next year and started digging, and uh, it turns out that there was probably 60 or 70% of that animal still under the ground, so <laughs> it's a pretty cool find. And that's what you were saying. That's kind of ideal. You want just the edge of the dinosaur sticking out. Exactly. The ideal find for a paleontologist is to, to, to just find the tip of the tail sticking out or, or the, the end of a toe sticking out, and then for the entire animal to still be under the ground. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't find animals all laid out like you picture a skeleton. If you've ever seen an animal carcass decay, it's only held together for a few days at most, and then pieces start disappearing. <laughs> so actually this nodosaur was probably buried quite rapidly because the bulk of the animal is not articulated. It's not in order, but it's what we call associated. Basically, most of the bones that went to the animal are, are still in the general area. <laughs> <laughs> when will you know enough to be able to name it? As soon as Corey f finishes the preparation on it. Yeah, I've got <laughs> that jacket and that jacket left, so... <laughs> <laughs> next year probably how long did it take for you to get that out of the rock two months oh that's actually quicker out, than out, i would have thought the ground out of the ground mm -hmm. okay uh. he, he's been working on it for taking it out of the jackets and things for the last two, <laughs> two years two years so uh we we dust we dug that in the summer of 2012 <laughs> founded fall of 2011 uh, and then i've been working on it ever since hmm <laughs> I was kind of wondering, it's a little bit of an aside, but how do you know, you had mentioned that you go roughly a meter away from the last bone that you find. Is that basically how you decide, okay, this is all of it, I'm wrap it up in plaster and take it out? Or It's really just an arbitrary number. At some point, you can dig for another 50 meters and not find another item, another piece. Mm -hmm. So you just set one meter, one meter is attainable. So you set it at one meter, you dig past that, and if you don't find anything else, you find a different direction to go. Hmm. And some sites, you wouldn't quit there. Other sites, you might quit sooner. It's Part of it is experience and, and learning how bones are deposited. We do a lot of experimentation with bones in streams and, and uh, flumes to determine just how carcasses can be deposited. But... Uh, you know, what that will tell us is which direction to dig in and how far to dig. Because, you know, I have dug on quarries where the bones are a meter apart. And I'll tell you, that's a miserable thing to do. <laughs> Were those sauropod quarries? Yes. Uh, a meter long bone a meter apart yeah. makes for a real big quarry. <laughs> it does. I think the other big dinosaur discovery that you haven't named yet is that Displetosaurus. That's uh, part of the bob core that Dave was talking about earlier. We'll, we'll work on that over the next few months, and hopefully we'll have a publication about this time next year. Cool. Sounds about right, doesn't it? It will be submitted about, well, sometime between November and this time next year. So the first of at least six publications we have listed that we want to do on that couple of those, we still have a lot of preparation to do. So that's that's one of those sites that is not just a, a single episode. That's kind of an entire person's lifetime career. <laughs> site. Not a good thing to find when you're a fledgling institution. <laughs> someone's PhD, someone's postdoc, someone's post-postdoc. <laughs> Pretty much. Cool. How many paleontologists do you have on staff? There's two of us with graduate degrees. We have three more that are adjunct staff, if you will. They're people on call that come and, and work part-time and have particular specialties. You know, when we find something that is in their realm of expertise, you know, they, they get involved. Otherwise, they have real jobs elsewhere. Cool. And you said it grows in the summer a little bit. More people show up to help, or are those more like volunteers? Our staff grows as well. We've got a geologist that's actually been head of 
main section of GSA for many years that comes out and teaches a class with us every summer. A lot of people like that that you know can afford a week or two, but our our facility is mostly volunteer and everything that we do is paid for by what comes through the door. So we can't afford to hire people like that full time. So hmm. they show up when they can afford to and when we can afford to have them. <laughs> cool. Is there anything else that people should know about this museum? For a little museum, we have already in our collections more significant specimens than probably anyone else on the Montana Dinosaur Trail except Museum of the Rockies. There's, there's us and a couple others that really have a lot of good stuff that we've found already. Our mission is actually to incorporate the public as much as possible in what we do. And Depends on education with actual, actual research. So we really are interested in people coming and seeing what we do. And that leads into one of my big missions, if you will, my soapbox is <laughs> paleontology is not a dead science. No pun intended. Well, <laughs> yes, there was a pun intended. The idea is so many of the things that we are doing that help modern human life and lifestyle comes from discoveries that we in the earth sciences have made, but we never get credit for it. So... <laughs> Anytime I have a venue like this, I, I like to talk about it. You know, if, if it weren't for us and our discoveries, people would still think that alligators and crocodiles were these primitive creatures that uh, if they were disturbed would eat their young. And they would still think that turtles and crocs had the same cold-blooded metabolism. There would be no... 30 plus major telescopes looking, scanning the stars for the next big rock from space that <laughs> might hit us. And, you know, there's issues with climate change that we have talked about that probably five, 10 years from now, you will hear all kinds of money being sent to, you know, modern climate research based on what they've got inaccurate at the moment. So, you know, we contribute a lot, but you know, it's, it's hard to make people understand that understanding the past is key to understanding what this earth is capable of and what we're going to face at the present and in the future. <laughs> but that's really what we do. Yeah. Yeah, it's important. Yeah, and we had a great time going out and learning. It was very yeah, educational, very fun. Yay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> What's your favorite dinosaur? We'll just go around. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is the one that I found. I don't, know what the, I don't know what its name is. <laughs> Do you have any ideas for names, or is that something? Not that, that I'm going to put on a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> Depending on how frustrated it is, it has several interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I like Therizinosaurus because it's very odd, and Microraptor again because it's very odd. You can relate to it, right? <laughs> yeah, just like me. <laughs> Mine has always been the one that my family and I have been involved with virtually every major discovery of since its first being known, and that's Myasaura. Montana State Fossil. <laughs> Put it on a license plate. <laughs> <laughs> Although my license plate, because of my last name, my nickname is Trex. So <laughs> I have Trex on my license plate. It wasn't until I actually got it and somebody... Saw it and came in. Oh, you like T Rex, huh? <laughs> no, not particularly. <laughs> well, you have it on your license plate. <laughs> no, oh, I guess I do. Sorry. About that. <laughs> That's <Oops>. great. <laughs> well, cool. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Yeah, thanks for coming out on our program thanks with for us. Out. Yeah. That was great. <laughs> yeah, I'm really glad we. Thanks did for this. not breaking anything <laughs> and for never having me freak out because you never said, "Uh oh." <laughs> <laughs> we kept that to ourselves. <laughs> Until we figured out that we didn't ruin anything. <laughs> Thanks again to everyone at Two Medicine Dinosaur Center. We had a fantastic time, even though it turns out paleontology is a lot of hard work. Yeah, we were basically scraping with dental tools on the side of a hill 
trying to find little tiny black pieces of fossilized eggshell. And Sabrina found one. Yeah. And Garrett found an actual piece of fossil on a different site. But... Yeah, but that had already been discovered. Mm, still. But they, they did a thing where they kind of walk you through a field and they say, everybody keep an eye out for a fossil and we're going to walk right by it. But don't point it out so that everybody in the group has a chance to look around and see if they can find it. And I figured it out. Yes. He's very <laughs> proud. Because they said most people don't see it. Yes. It was very. It was a very broken up and weathered, I think, uh, limb bone from a hadrosaur. Mm-hmm. It was cool. I also want to give a big thanks to Corey for taking us behind the scenes and letting Garrett touch some of the fossils. Yeah, there were some really cool notosaur ones. Yeah. So we're really excited when that paper comes out for the as yet unnamed dinosaur. Yeah, there should be some really cool publications coming out of there soon we're excited about. Before we get into the dinosaur of the day, we have another word from our sponsor, Audible, who is offering a free audiobook download with a 30-day free trial for all of our listeners. One of our dinosaur books, written, read, and published by Sabrina, titled What Happened to Brontosaurus, is on Audible, and you can get that book for free by using our promo code, or you can get lots of other books. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash I know dino. Again, that's audibletrial as one word, dot com slash I know dino, also one word, no capitals, <laughs> for your free audiobook. And once you're there, you can do a search for our book, or you can check out another book from their massive collection. I really enjoy etymology, <laughs> which you might notice when we talk about the origins of a new dinosaur, or like when we were talking about she sells seashells by the seashore. Or when we talk about anything. Yeah. <laughs> because it seems like just about every word has an interesting origin story. And that's what the Etymologicon by Mark Forsyth is all about. And it does a lot of quick explorations into the origins of different words. And I really enjoy it. One of the fun things about etymology is you can tell a lot about the time period based on the connotation of the word and kind of how it evolves over time. Although it's often hard to know if the meaning is exactly where we think it's from. Like a lot of times there's a Latin root that's kind of similar, so you know, well, it's related, but you don't really know who was the first person to say it or exactly where it came from. They usually have like a first known use kind of thing. But there's a fun one that I want to share that I don't know if it's in the book because I haven't finished reading it yet, but it's one of my favorite etymology stories. So the word guy originally referred to an effigy of Guy Fox. Later, it became a unknown, especially an ugly person celebrating Guy Fox night. And then it just replaced the word fellow to mean any man. And all of that happened in the span of about 40 years in the early 1800s. So maybe Mary Anning was calling people guys in different meanings. Like, but, hey guys, I found this plesiosaur. Maybe. <laughs> and now, at least in a lot of the U.S. and Canada, the plural you guys is used as a gender neutral equivalent of y'all, which is good because it's really a pain in the butt to say, hey, everyone or something like that. Yeah, extra syllables. Yeah. It Bummer. Just, it sounds weird. But a lot of people do argue that guys isn't really gender neutral, so it's inappropriate to call women guys, but I'm definitely in the gender neutral camp because I think it's a very useful word. How about use guys? <laughs> I don't know if that makes it any better. <laughs> <laughs> and whether it's use guys or you guys, one could argue that they don't like being called a guy at all because they don't support terrorism like Guy Fox was attempting to do 400 years ago where the word origin comes from. So anyway, I really enjoy etymology. And as Foster the People would say, call it what you want. So if you want to learn some more about etymology and you found that little rant interesting and not super boring like Sabrina might have, you can check out the Etymologicon by going to audibletrial.com slash I know dino. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> now on to our dinosaur of the day, Shantungosaurus, which was a request from Garrett via Facebook. Not this Garrett, a different Garrett. 
<laughs> so thanks. The name means Shandong lizard, and the type species is Shantungosaurus giganteus. It was described in 1973 by Hu and known from five incomplete skeletons, and they found a bone bed with the five individuals. They composited bones to mount one of the largest hadrosaurids, and the composite skeleton is mounted at the Geological Institute of China in Beijing, and it's 48 feet or 14.7 meters long. Another mounted skeleton, which used to be called Duchengosaurus maximus, is 54 feet or 16.6 meters long. And now Duchengosaurus maximus is considered by many to be a synonym of Shentungosaurus. Uh, some people think that it was a different growth stage. So, Shantungosaurus is one of the largest known ornithischians. Yeah, that's huge. 48 feet long for an ornithischian. <laughs> yeah. It m may have weighed up to 16 tons or 18 short tons, and the skull that was found is 5.3 feet or 1.63 meters long. Oof. Yeah, Spinosaurus had a similar length, but didn't weigh as much. It's not clear why this dinosaur was so large, but... It was a saurolophene hadrosaurid that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now China. And Xu Xing and colleagues said that it is similar to Edmontosaurus. And now that we have met Xu Xing and seen that he works with Phil Curry, who is from Canada, it's kind of interesting that he makes this comparison to this Canadian dinosaur. Yeah, he was saying too that there are a lot of similarities between some Chinese and some North American dinosaurs. So... Shantungosaurus had no crest on the top of its skull, but it had a large nasal opening. Near its nostrils was a large hole, possibly covered by a loose flap that it could inflate to make sounds. Huh. And it may have made sounds to defend its territory. It also had a toothless beak, but its jaws had 1,500 chewing teeth. Good old dental batteries. Yep, they get the job done. <laughs> so Shantungosaurus is part of the family Hadrosauridae, which is also known as duckbill dinosaurs. And that's a family of common herbivores from the Cretaceous whose fossil has been found in Asia, Europe, and North America. Yeah, they're everywhere. In large numbers. The cows of the Cretaceous, as they're called. Yep. <laughs> and our fun fact of the day is that even though snakes can't see as wide of a spectrum of red as dinosaurs probably could, because they don't have that special oil droplet, red pigmented oil droplet, they can, quote-unquote, see infrared, also known as heat. In fact, the pit viper is named after a pit that looks a little bit like a nostril, but is actually a sensitive infrared detector. And they appear to use the organ while hunting to find an exposed area on warm-blooded prey. If you imagine an IR camera, exposed skin is always brighter than covered areas. If you've ever seen one of those like, you know, thermal image things, the face and the head are always lit up. And then if somebody's wearing a shirt, you can see where the shirt ends and then their uncovered arm starts. So if a snake was pointed at you, it would be like, oh, that arm looks way more appealing than that part that's covered by clothing. Oh, or, remind me to not be near snakes. <laughs> or furry, you know, you don't want to bite into fur, scaly armor. You'd rather bite into something more, you know, exposed to the warmth Hmm. But this is only in some snakes, pit vipers, and a couple other types of snakes. It's still relatively uncommon. And the IR detecting pits have evolved at least twice independently among different groups of snakes. So with that being said, I'd like to think that maybe a few dinosaurs evolved the ability too. As if they're not scary enough. Yeah. But since it's like a soft tissue thing you probably wouldn't be able to tell from the fossil record if they could detect IR. And if, say, T-Rex had evolved infrared vision, we couldn't tell by looking at birds, since T-Rex had already split off from the group of dinosaurs that later evolved into birds. Did Indominus Rex and Jurassic World have this capability? I don't remember. I can't remember, but it seems like it might have. <laughs> it probably did. It seems like they gave it all sorts of abilities. I was mostly thinking of it because the little holes in the jaw of the T-Rex reminded me of these pits. Hmm. I was thinking, yeah, what if it could detect infrared? That would be cool and terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it would really be that useful for a T-Rex considering it already had really good eyesight and its mouth was so huge that I don't know how 
targeted its attack could, could be. Could also but, bite through anything, so. Yeah, it probably wouldn't need it, but. But still. <laughs> just in case. It's nice to have. <laughs> And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. And if you would like to join our growing community of supporters, then please check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.